Good morning, good morning. Uh, after Linda's description of what they're going to eat at Thanksgiving, I thought, ah, let's just have a prayer for the food and walk out, right? Let's go eat. I am excited for opportunity to be together. Let's open our Bibles to 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse 26. 14 and verse 26. We've been in a series since September on 1 Corinthians chapters 12, 13, and 14. And in chapter 12, he explains what it means when a group of people gather together and commit to be family and what it can look like when it goes well and what it can look like when it doesn't go well. So he says that the solution for when it's not going well is to get back to the heart. And so he de- dedicates all of chapter 13 to love. He comes out of chapter 13 into chapter 14 and says, Now, following the way of love would mean that out of all of the gifts of the Spirit that he gives to build up the body of Christ, eagerly desire prophecy. Now, we've talked about this, so I want to clarify. There's a worldly definition of prophecy. There's a biblical definition of prophecy. The worldly definition is lottery ticket prophecy. It's kind of like crystal ball, tell the future, that kind of a thing. What we're talking about in the body of Christ is it is speaking forth the word of the Lord, whether it is past, present, or future. It's about building up the body of Christ. It's about strengthening, encouraging, and comforting the body of Christ. And the Apostle Paul says... You all need to eagerly want it. That's what you've got to desire, is that when you open your mouth for the sake of the body of Christ, let strength, comfort, and encouragement come out in the voice of the Lord through you. So he says in verse 26, so what do we say then, brothers and sisters? When you come together... Each of you has a hymn, a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Everyone together ready? Everything must be done so that the church may be built up. But you realize that everything wasn't being done so that the church may be built up. That's why I had to write this. This is a corrective text. It means we're off track, and now we got to get back on track, right? Well, they didn't have a YouTube video to figure out how to get back on track. So the Apostle Paul has to spell it out in words. And here's what he says are the corrective measures. Now, bear in mind, listen carefully, he's putting training wheels back on them spiritually. They're they're not meant to be there forever, right? Can you imagine training wheels on a Tour de France bicycle, right? They're not meant to be there forever. But because they got off the rails, he's got to get them back on. So he's going to give them training wheels. And the three training wheels are in the following verses. You ready? So, if anyone speaks in a tongue, two or at the most three should speak. One at a time. Someone must interpret. If there's no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet in the church and just speak to himself and to God. Two or three prophets should speak, and the other should weigh carefully what's being said. Now, if a revelation comes to someone who's sitting down, the first speaker should stop, for you can all prophesy in turn so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. You see, the spirits are of the prophets, are subject to the control of the prophets. For God isn't a God of disorder, but of peace. And so is in all the congregations of the Lord's people. Number three, women should remain silent in the churches. They're not allowed to speak, but must be in submission, as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home. For it's disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. Or did the word of God originate with you? Or are you the only people it has reached? If anyone thinks they're a prophet or otherwise gifted by the Spirit, you let them acknowledge that what I'm writing to you is the Lord's command. But if anyone ignores this, they themselves will be ignored. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy. Do not forbid speaking in tongues, but everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. 
Now, I want you to think about that last phrase because some of us learned it differently. We learned with decency and in order, right? Well, let's back up through this passage. We'll start right here. And let's go to work on what the Apostle Paul is doing as a correction for how the church got off track. Number one, he says, do things decently and in order. Now, the word decent there is not first and foremost about the structure of the church. It's about the structure of your life. In the book of Acts, when that same word is used, listen carefully, it's used about the upright leading women in communities. He's talking about these women who aren't even Christians yet, but they have an active conscience and they want to do what's right. And Paul says, if you've got someone out in the world that's trying to figure out what's right and they look at you and surmise that you don't know what's right, how are you going to be a witness? You have got to live structurally, your selfhood, the way you interact with people. And listen, this is important. Even with just first impressions and observation, Paul says, live the witness so that people who are looking for someone who knows God will, will surmise that you do. So that's decently and in order. It's also essential that you notice that he says, be eager to prophesy and don't forbid speaking in tongues. These are both imperatives. Listen, what is he saying? This is crucial. You ready? This is crucial. The gifts are not the problem. Being gifted in the body of Christ, this is not what's causing our problem. When I was in high school, I had a friend. His name was John. He had a 1971 Camaro Z28. Just try to imagine the coolest car a high school kid could have, and that was it. And we all drooled over that car. We loved that car. And I remember the day that I saw it getting loaded up on a tow truck because John had totaled it. We weren't crying for John, but man, we were crying that he totaled a Z28. I asked John, I said, what happened? He said, a mosquito. I'm like, huh? A mosquito caused that? You know, you know what I'm thinking, right? You didn't hit a mosquito and it totaled your car. Now, the mosquito was on the inside. He was slapping at a mosquito while he was driving, took his eyes off the road, slammed into the back of the car in front of him, and totaled his car. So it actually was a mosquito. What the Apostle Paul says is, when you're paying more attention to your gifts than you are the gift giver, you're slapping at mosquitoes spiritually. And you're going to wreck your influence in the church because you're slapping at mosquitoes. When you think your gift is bigger than anything else that's going on, you are inadvertently going to total someone's faith, maybe your own. So Paul says, so let's think of three correctives. The first corrective was this. If you look at yourself as someone that's being spiritual, like you know, you kind of got it together, how are you measuring that? How are you measuring that? Well, you know, I don't drink, you know, I don't drink, I don't smoke, you know. I ain't, you know, out there chasing women or chasing men or whatever. Okay, I'm happy for you. But if that's the only way that you're measuring this, I got to tell you something. I tried smoking as a kid because I wanted to be like my dad, and it made me sick. I tried drinking because I wanted to be like my dad, I'm older brother, and it made me sick. So the fact that I don't drink and don't smoke has zero spiritual credibility in my life. I wouldn't do it if I was an atheist. That's not a measurement of my spirituality. He says, well, what about the gift of speaking in tongues? Surely if you have the gift of speaking in tongues, you're spiritual. He said the gift may be from the Spirit, but the way you're using it is not from the Spirit. It's the structure of your life, not the gift you're using, that determines whether or not you are spiritual. So he says, listen, if you're misusing your gifts, stop. So what's the corrective measure? The corrective measure is if you feel the Spirit of God stirring within you, but there is no one there to interpret speaking in tongues, and it can't benefit the church, then shut it down. You say, well, why? Because you're not helping the body of Christ. Well, we might think, did someone actually have to tell you to shut it down if you weren't going to help the body of Christ? Well, that's how far off the rails they were. Did you notice how some of his instructions sounded like kids? 
Now each of you can do this. Take your turn. He said it twice. How are Christian people to gather together as the body of Christ and they're not taking turns? Well, if you ever taught kindergarten kids, you know, right? Might have to teach them how to take turns. So he says, number one, if you think you're spiritual, but it is determined that you're misusing your gift, the first corrective measure is shut that down until it's a part of your spiritual instinct to realize that my voice isn't the only voice. And if I'm using my voice in a way that's tearing down the church, I need to close my mouth and allow the Spirit of God to redeem my heart so when I open my mouth again, it's for the good of the church. Here's the second corrective. He said, if you're up and you're delivering a word, like a prophetic word, and you're giving encouragement and comfort and strengthening and instructing, and someone else seated gets a prophetic word, then shut it down. You might say, well, why would you, if someone else got a word, why would you demand that you hold the stage? Well, it's because you believe that the gift promotes you instead of you being used by God to promote the work of the Spirit in the world. You've become the mosquito. See, I want you to consider this. Shouldn't it be second nature that if I'm speaking a word from the Lord and someone else receives a word from the Lord, that I would gladly yield So that the body is demonstrated that it's not one voice that does all the speaking. Not one voice that does all the praying. Not one voice that does all the singing. You see, when we trust the body of Christ, it becomes second nature to make room for each other. In the Corinthian church, they were unwilling to make room for each other because the gift was a way to exalt self. So what does Paul tell them to do? Shut it down. Now, you do understand this is men and women. So when he gets into the third corrective, and he says, let's go ahead and move to this, verse 34, where he tells the women to be quiet. Look with me, if you would, at verse 35. What are they actually supposed to do? What's the corrective? If they want to inquire about something, they should do what? Go ask their husbands at home. Have any of you ever wondered why he leaves out all the single ladies? Because what did he say to do? If you want to ask a question, go do what? It's, I mean, it's right on your Bible. What does it say? Go ask your husband. So what do the single ladies do? Oh, I've heard this over the years. Well, the single ladies, you know, they go ask their brother, their father, their cousin. That's not what this says. You see, the fact that this says go ask your husband, back up to verse 34, the word woman here, we've already studied this in the original language, is also the exact same word for wife. If it's translated husband of verse 35, if that's how we're translating that text, then this should be translated wives. What we have here is we have a domestic issue that is invading the body of Christ. What we've got is we've got the same problem as the first two, someone drawing attention to themselves. So someone's up delivering a prophecy, this person's woman, the woman whose man is on the stage, begins this this banter in the middle of the service. Paul says, if you want a banter like that, you guys take it home. So here's what I want you to notice. As a corrective measure, there's three things that have got to happen. If it wraps around tongue speaking, if you don't know how to handle tongue speaking, then shut it down until you allow yourself to submit to the Spirit. If you don't know how to handle the body of Christ being more than one prophetic voice, shut it down until your heart is retuned to God through the Spirit. And if you don't know how to disagree or to weigh in on a prophetic word in the middle of the service with your spouse or the man in your family, then stop what you're doing in the middle of the service and take it home. Now, I want you to think about something for just a moment. When I was growing up, that is not how I was taught to understand this text. So I want to talk about that for a moment. The way I was taught to understand the text was, is that there was a restriction on the vocalization of female voices in the body of Christ. And what that meant was, there were places women could not vocalize, they couldn't speak, There were times when women couldn't speak, and there were people with whom women couldn't speak. Now, do you get what I'm saying? 
right? So there were times they couldn't speak, in situations they couldn't speak, and with men that they couldn't speak. That's how the restriction was laid out. Now, I realize it wasn't the same in every church. So in some churches, women were not allowed to pray at home with their brothers or their, or their fathers. So they weren't allowed to pray at all with men in their presence. In other churches, women could pray at home with their brothers and with their fathers, but not with other men present. In some churches, women could teach a boy of any age until he was baptized or he was at the age of accountability, somewhere around 12 or 13 years old. But that wasn't the same for every church. So what was the same for every church? That the restriction had to do with gender. That was what was the same for every church. But how it played out was different. When we moved to Ohio, my wife and I had the opportunity. We lived in southeastern Ohio, but north of us was a very large Mennonite community in northeast Ohio. We discovered that in a few of those churches, the way they practiced it was not a restriction, but a prohibition. The women were not allowed to sing. Now, what did it say? They need to remain silent, which to them meant they can't even sing. These women in those churches, the women were seated on one side, the men on the other. So the division of gender was even in the seating chart. Okay, you feel what I'm saying? So it wasn't just a restriction, it was a prohibition. Now, I found other churches where people just said, well, Paul was just a chauvinist. He was a first century misogynist who really doesn't know how to handle the topics of God, the church, or scripture. But if you read the text carefully and you're understanding that it is all a corrective measure, then another option opens up. That option is that in 1 Corinthians 11, he has already said that men and women are prophesying and praying in the assembly. We know in the Old and the New Testament, women and men prophesied. We know in the New Testament, when the Holy Spirit came and inaugurated the great redemptive work of God through the church, that the very first sign that was quoted in Acts chapter 2 was that men and women would prophesy. So when we bring these scriptures together, we realize that when we're called, all of us, to eagerly desire the gift of prophecy it is not rooted in gender who speaks or who does not it is rooted in the spirit so see now gender does not automatically qualify one group over another because if it does then you can't make out of the first any sense out of the first two correctives which tells men and women that if your heart ain't right you got to shut it down the same word for silence is used in all three correctives whatever is right for the men is right for the women whatever's right for the women is right for the men but now i want to bring this home in a more uh, a succinct and pointed way and that is this god is doing something in the world god is redeeming the world he's restoring the world he's renewing the world and so what god does is god gives gifts and when god gives gifts Everyone that is gifted by God is elevated to the image of the living God being born again, recreated in his image. So I I want you to think about these gifts. You ready? Number one, first order giftedness. What do I mean by first order? I mean the first thing God did, first thing God thought about, first sacrifice God made. And that first gift is that God gave God's self to the project of humanity. Say that to yourself. God gave God's self to the project of humanity. Say it again. God gave God's self to the project of humanity. God didn't create a humanity he couldn't sustain. God did not create a humanity he couldn't sustain. When we prepared for the birth of our children, we bought diapers because we knew what was coming. Do I need to say any more about that little metaphor? 
When God created the world, he knew what was coming, and he prepared in advance by giving God's self. The Bible says, for God so loved the world, he gave his only son. Revelation 13, 8 says that Jesus Christ is the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. Before God ever made the world, he created what was going to be necessary to sustain the world in salvation. First order gift is God said, I will give myself to you and for you. That's number one. And number two is the gift of creation. God went ahead and made you. He went ahead and made you. You're like, well, maybe he was having an off day. (laughs) Maybe I was right at the end of the production line. No. In your mother's womb, it was God who was knitting you together. Oh, I know we get messed up along the way. Other people trying to braid their sinful threads into our holy DNA. But listen, through the grace of Jesus Christ, you are who you are. You are God's daughter. You are God's child. The gift of creation says God wanted you to be here, wants you to make it, and he's got a home prepared for you in heaven. Don't you dare miss it. Which brings us to gift number three, and that is the gift of salvation. When God recognized that we had the potential to be like him and to exercise choice, he knew that those choices could go downhill. And so God was at the bottom of the hill waiting on us. The Bible tells us that on the hill of Calvary, Jesus took all of our sin on himself and gave us the righteousness of God. So the first order gift is God himself. Second order gift is creation. Third order gift is salvation. Here's the fourth order gift. You ready for this? God gave the Holy Spirit to dwell in us. God gave us a gift that keeps on giving gifts. God gave us the gift that keeps on giving gifts. The Holy Spirit doesn't give you just give you gifts. The Holy Spirit gives you God's self. God is dwelling in you. Do you know what that means? That in your skin, behind your eyes, inside your ears, is the living God. Wow, you must be something. You must be amazing. Oh, I know my grandkids are amazing. What are you even talking about? Babies are awesome. You know why we think babies are awesome? We think they're awesome because we put on to them an innocence that we no longer claim for ourselves. That is an insult to the salvation of God because God can make you more perfect in recreation through the blood of Jesus Christ. When you are born again, you are born not only without sin, but all your shame and guilt is also taken away. When you stand before God in heaven, you ain't crawling in there, bawling your eyes out like you blew it. You are standing before God, walking down Main Street in heaven saying, here I come. And God said, come on home. That's what God is doing in you when God sees you. He doesn't see that old sinful self. He sees himself in you shining through your eyes. These are the gifts that God is giving. So when he finally passes out the gifts of prophecy and all of these other gifts, you know what he's trying to say to you? I trust you. I love you. Together we'll do this. I've been looking for someone just like you. And so when he puts his gift in, gifts in people of different colors, then all of a sudden this whole idea that somehow one color is superior to another, it's shown for the foolishness that it is. The deceitfulness of such silliness in social divisions is exposed because if gifts of God are coming out of every beautiful color on the planet, then that tells us that all of us were meant to be together. So listen carefully. The same thing is true for gender. When God poured his gifts into both men and women, when he fulfilled the prophecy of Joel that your old men and your young men, your older women and your younger women, your men and your women, they will all prophesy because the Holy Spirit will be poured out on all flesh. God is saying, I'm going to remake the world the way it was meant to be made. So the difference isn't gender. The difference is the structure of your spirituality. Do you believe that the gifts are there to do something to elevate you, or do you believe that they've already done that, and the gifts are given to display the glory of God? You see, this is what we've been given. What could be better 
than to know that the living God gave God self for you, created you, saved you, indwells you, and gifts you, and says, you do realize that I've waited your whole life for you to open your heart to how special you are, how loved you are, and I want you to live into it with great fullness. That's what we're trying to do in this church. I don't want to total my faith slapping at mosquitoes. Mosquitoes. You see what I'm saying? Well, I took that old Camaro. I bought that crazy thing. I did. I bought that old wrecked Camaro. I did. Because down in the heart of that old wrecked Camaro was a very unique engine. And I wanted it. I won't tell you all about it because it will bore you. But I met many law enforcement officers as a result. <laughs> and I pulled that engine and that transmission out and I slid it down into my little old car. And it changed my little old car. <laughs> People had no idea what they were up against when that little old car acted like it was a big old car. <laughs> People have no idea what to do with you when they want to make you a little old life. But you got the Spirit of God living in you. Let's live into the giftedness of Almighty God. One of our shepherds is going to come and share with us just a special Thanksgiving, a Thanksgiving blessing over the church. Would you welcome Fernando Nassim?